Even if you choose a career which doesn't keep you sitting behind a desk, you will find, once you're on the job, that writing is a part of just about every profession. Whether it's a police report of an arrest, a film director's movie script, or a summary of findings and recommendations for a board meeting, no doubt you will find it necessary to make use of your writing skills throughout your career. Under Medicaid, uh, under Medicaid we issue bus tickets. We're doing between about... The writing assignments you've been given so far have generally acquainted you with the process of researching information and organizing your thoughts on a given subject. Now we need to apply those skills to other fields, such as writing for the humanities or the social sciences. Today we've assembled a panel of professors and professional writers to discuss the kinds of issues that are special to writing for the humanities. Humanities, of course, covers subjects such as literature, fine arts, and philosophy. We'll be talking to our panel about the kinds of issues which are unique to writing in these areas. But first, let's take a look at one particular kind of writing commonly called for in humanities classes, the explication. An explication of a book or film or other piece of art involves critiquing that work. You can evaluate a painting, for example, by examining the artist's style, use of symbolism, color, medium, or composition. An explication of a poem might analyze its meaning, or it might study the poem's rhyme or meter or symbolism. Although an explication will express your own sense of what the piece is about and how the artist achieved it, this does not mean that research is not involved. Suppose you are writing an explication of Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms. You may first want to look up other critical essays on Hemingway's work in either the MLA Bibliography, the Essay and General Literature Index, or the Humanities Index. There you might find several different aspects of this work critiqued. Hemingway's writing style, his themes, his use of symbolism and point of view. Depending on your assignment and the approach you intend to take, you may want to draw on these criticisms as research for your essay. For example, you could compare what others have said about Hemingway's writing style, his terse sentences and straightforward descriptions. Or you may want to read criticisms of his other books to see if he uses themes or symbols similar to those works used in A Farewell to Arms. If you choose to quote from other sources, follow the same process you used when taking notes and documenting your research paper. On the other hand, you may simply be asked to write your own interpretation of the novel. In that case, the book itself becomes your primary source, and you will not have several works from which to take notes or to cite. Whichever approach you take, writing the explication will differ slightly from writing a research paper. A research paper compiles existing information on a subject and draws conclusions from the facts. An explication attempts to clarify the meaning of a given work. An explication is commentary, and as such, it states your own analysis of the meaning or characteristics of a specific piece of work. It is not a paraphrase or rewording of the original, nor is it a summary of the plot, as may be the case with a film, play, or book. An explication is not concerned with biographical or historical details either, unless that information somehow sheds more light on the meaning of the work. For example, the fact that Hemingway was born in Oak Park, Illinois in 1899, or that he spent much time in Key West during his lifetime, does not give us much insight into his book, A Farewell to Arms. However, the fact that he was a journalist in his early career does bear significance on his writing style. Hemingway's prose is not flowery or excessively descriptive. Hemingway writes, It was a hot day and there were many flies in the room. I watched them settle on the ceiling. Hemingway's style is factual and it more closely resembles newspaper writing than the styles of other fiction writers of his day. In this case, biographical information on the author amplifies our understanding of his work. As you review biographical information, ask yourself, does this information have relevance to my critique or am I just filling space? Remember that a criticism of any piece involves analysis. 
This is not the kind of information you might find in an encyclopedia or a biography. Often your approach in writing an explication will differ from the approach you take for a research paper or essay. When you're analyzing a poem, for example, it is logical to let the poem's organization dictate your own. So you may want to organize your essay as the poem is organized by taking each line of the poem and examining it sequentially. For example, look at these four lines from The Balloon of the Mind by Yeats. Hand, do what you're bid. Bring the balloon of the mind that belies and drags in the wind into its narrow shed. These four lines are about writing poetry, the difficulty of getting one's floating thoughts down on paper. Line one is blunt. It is a directive to the author's hands, ordering them to do what they're supposed to do. Lines two and three ramble, like the mind rambles. These lines amplify the metaphor of the poem, that the mind is like an airy, unwieldy balloon. The poet also uses alliteration in these lines. Bring, bid, balloon, and belies. Finally, the last phrase is succinct and compressed, echoing the analogy of a poet pulling an idea down onto paper and making it concrete. Just as we examine this poem line for line in the example, you can write your explication in this way. As you can see, the structure of the poem itself determines the way you organize your thoughts when writing about it. There are two problems to watch for when using this format. First, try to avoid repetitious phrases like in line one, in line two, in line three. Instead, try to vary your language, such as in the first stanza or line one suggests the second concern is to be sure you have a clear understanding of the terms you use, such as symbolism and meter or iambic pentameter. You may want to look up these terms before using them. When you explicate a larger work, such as a novel, you will organize your writing around a thesis, much like you do for an essay or a research paper. Using the earlier example of Hemingway's writing style, you might state your thesis this way. Hemingway's style departs from traditional fictional prose in that it contains simple declarative sentences and avoids excessively descriptive language. The thesis becomes very important in guiding your writing. Your essay could then go on to illustrate the ways in which Hemingway's style departs from other writers by quoting from Hemingway's work and by comparing his writing to other more traditional fiction writers. Although an explication is a commentary, your idea should focus on the work you're criticizing rather than your own experience or opinions. Here are two different interpretations of Robert Frost's stopping by woods on a snowy evening. See if you can tell the difference between personal analysis and personal opinion. This poem can be thought of as a statement of man's everlasting responsibility to man. Though the dark and nothingness tempt him to surrender, he will not give in. Almost every day we find ourselves faced with the lures of temptation. While we were in college, we were often tempted to do what's easiest and neglect our studies and party. However, we know that we have promises to keep and obligations to be fulfilled. The last analysis obviously injects too much of the writer's personal experience into it. While it offers an interpretation of the poem's meaning, it strays from the original focus of the poem by infusing opinion into its meaning. There are several other concerns to be aware of when writing an analysis of any piece of work, not only literature, but also music, art, and philosophy. With us today are several people who teach and write professionally in these areas, and we'll be discussing with them the various kinds of special issues presented when writing for the humanities. I guess a central question we could ask uh, is, what kind of expectations do we have for our students uh, in our individual courses. Howard, you teach composition and literature and humanities, general humanities. What are some of the things you look for in student writing? At the freshman and the sophomore level, first of all, I want them to write something that's coherent with a good beginning, a middle, and an end. So the first paragraph is very important. They need to be able to state where the paper is going. And if I only read the first paragraph, I should know most of the highlights would be discussed in the paper. And that's the be-all and end-all of good writing, is to have order to it. 
What about in a, in a literature course or in a humanities course that deals with, say, literature or even art? I want it to be processed through them in some form or the other. I want them to react to it. Uh, I may require, on occasion, a research paper of some nature, in which case I want in-text citation. But if they are reading uh, a piece of literature, I want to know personally the, the, uh, what they're seeing. And each person will see something slightly different, perhaps, because if we have the truth in the middle and everyone standing around, we are all seeing the same thing, but from a different angle. So, And I want them to feel free to see uh, something that is there that I may not see, and uh, to write about it. Marion, you teach music and general humanities. Humanities. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you expect of a student in those courses, in the, in the writing in those courses? Well, in both of those courses, I expect literacy. And I tell them, although this is not an English course, mm -hmm. I want you to reflect in the course what you have learned elsewhere. And um, not only in English courses, but in all of your courses, mm -hmm. because the humanities permits them to bring in all of their experiences mm -hmm. on the academic level. So I expect literacy, mm -hmm. and I also expect them to write so that I can understand it and I put myself in a position of not knowing, you mm -hmm. know, the subject thoroughly. So I want them, I encourage them to write as if they were introducing me to it. Okay. You know. Do you, do you have a sort of reaction paper in which you invite uh, uh, their own thinking on a oh, subject? Oh yes, a okay. great deal. Uh, uh, what I find that I have to do at the very beginning of the courses is to get them to understand what the humanities are right. you know, or what yeah. the area is. I think one of the most difficult things in the humanities uh, is, as you say, at the beginning, what what are the humanities? Right. What, what is a study of the humanities? Mm -hmm. But focusing again, Lawton, on this central question, what do you you teach philosophy and religion? I do. Uh, what do you expect of student writing? Like Mary and I, try to get them to be so explicit in writing to me that I can make sense of their paper, even though I did not know the subject matter myself. I'm especially concerned about a good logical order when my students write. Sometimes I have students try to um, fit their paper into a form that they were taught in an English composition course, but the material I have them working with doesn't lend itself to being put in that kind of form. So I have to tell them, let the uh, material itself and its own logic dictate the kind of form that you will use when you write for me. My problem in teaching the humanities uh, is uh, Again, I spend quite a bit of time defining what the humanities are at the beginning, and uh, I think it's very important that we, a lot of humanities deals with art. You know, what is art? Uh, and again, we're into the definition problem. And after they understand what art is, how do we write about art? And then we get into the problem of what the artistic process is. How about you? With uh... um, I try to impress upon my students that what we are about is trying to come to some self-realization you know mm -hmm. by the end of the term we will would have achieved that on some level and I lead them to look at the humanities uh, in the sense of assisting their cultural awareness and the ability to observe objectively so order is important in, in in writing about the humanities, uh, personal growth, I think you're, you're saying, is, is important. Um, philosophical insight's important. I guess the central question is, what, what are the humanities and what can they really do for the student? And in that process, where does writing really fall? Or is that a loaded question? <laughs> <laughs> let's start with, uh, in the beginning was the word. Okay, let's start with the beginning. Okay. If you start out, and in an, if you're analyzing something, if you're looking at a poem, lyrics, anything along that line, you're dealing with words, someone's words. The words are selected for a reason. They have meaning. So if a student is being asked to, to analyze something, if he or she will focus on what is there, like a detective, and just simply keep coming back to what is there, and an, interpreting it according to the perspective that's there, applying it if it's part of the assignment, 
uh, to what they need to do. I think that's somewhat helpful. And if when you are dealing with the abstract, that's a part of us that deals with the abstractions of life. And there's another part that deals with the concrete things. And I think as far as writing is concerned, you go back to the things that you can visualize, that you can smell, that you can taste, and um, put down on paper. I right. think um, I'm really trying to get my students habituated to drawing out the implications of a thesis or a concept so that they can evaluate that thesis or that concept. Okay. Anyone else? I think along with that, one problem, practical problem from the standpoint of the student is what's the nature of the assignment? How long is the assignment? If it's a term paper, you have a certain um, amount of material you can cover. And if it's a shorter paper, it's a harder one to write because it has to be more focused. And if you find that you are writing a paper beginning with Edgar Allan Poe was born in the year, well, you're re you are regurgitating what's in the encyclopedia and you're off on the wrong track. So look at your idea that you want to talk about so that you do have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And see, or if you're dealing with a book-sized topic, you're not writing a book, you're probably writing a chapter or you're writing a, a short essay in that. So what would you have in the book if you're talking about determinism or if you're talking about Edgar Allan Poe? What's that chapter called or what's that part of that chapter called? But keep focusing and focusing until you have something that you, that you can deliver on because if it's a short paper, you can't deliver on the literary works of Edgar Allan Poe. And beginning writers, often uh, one problem is they bite off more than they can chew. They take a, uh, a large, broad subject and they don't narrow it to where it can be dealt with in a short paper. Well, we've looked at some pitfalls and we've looked at some beginnings and we started with the word. <laughs> How about the sound and music? It's a different experience for the yeah. student. What do you expect of a I, I still emphasize literacy. I want to see a well-organized paper, mm -hmm. uh, continuity, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of your thesis and the content and then the conclusion of that paper. But at the same time, I want you to demonstrate that you have begun to attempt to develop the perceptive listening skill. I want to see you utilize the musical vocabulary, mm -hmm. you know. And at the same time, I want you to express um, your own personal reactions to the total experience of immersing yourself in this uh, discipline. Let me seize on that point a minute. Okay, Howard, uh, I'm a student now in your uh, literature class. I don't know a thing about literature. It's the first part of the course. Whenever, What's going to be my first writing assignment? Well, students frequently will tend to dislike poetry. Even though poetry, sometimes you have to take poetry and sneak it past them and get them to enjoy it even though they don't realize what they're doing. So let's separate poetry and talk about uh, short fiction and short stories. Okay. You can break this up into, you don't want to tell a story, you don't want to tell a plot, that's, that's, that's not the point of writing um, unless you're talking about structure. And then you're not talk, telling the story, you're talking about what begins at certain points, you know, when, when these things occur. You can ask them to write on characters. Uh, look at a short story from the standpoint of characters. Using Wizard of Oz is a good example on that. You have someone who's out there on a quest and she has uh, her assistants and her colleagues, the Cowardly Lion and so on. So you can divide it into major and minor characters, uh, dynamic characters, static characters, um, and so, so on along. Dynamic meaning changing, changing throughout the, the story and, and, and or characters can, that just stay the and same, you can static. categorize them and tell why a particular character is uh, a dynamic character, how this character changes, and use an example from the story, the play, whatever you're writing about, to emphasize the point. Let me get to Professor Green here. I'm a first-term philosophy student now, and what kind of writing are... Uh, I don't know anything about philosophy. <laughs> the kind of thinking and reflecting you do that goes into your writing is going to be the critical consideration. Mm -hmm. So my task as a teacher is to get you to reading very carefully whatever text you're going to base your writing upon and to reflecting deeply about the content of those texts. What sort of writing assignment are you going to give me then to stimulate that? It, uh, it can vary. Uh, there will be a series of um, writing projects or a series of responses on a given writing project. Then there may even be a fiction writing project in which you display your knowledge of that essay through this fictional writing mode. You mean write a story about the 
Yes, you we've have been treating, write a story treating some that. issue in moral philosophy. We have some description of whom the philosopher regards as a good man, then I can have you create a person who satisfies his description and maybe put him in hypothetical situations where he will act as that philosopher thinks a person of nobility and good character will act. Do you recall any uh, assignments where uh, Howard mentioned the Wizard of Oz uh, in his? Do you recall any specific assignments or situations that the student wrote about pretty effectively? Well, yes, recently uh, I had them write a fictional story based upon Thomas Hobbes um, Leviathan, Leviathan yeah. and had them put themselves in the in the situation of a person who was living in that brutal condition that Hobbes called the state of nature. Solitary, and, nasty, brutal, and short. And had them actually construct a little story in which a man did the kinds of things that Hobbes said a man would be compelled to do when living in an uncivilized um, setting. Marion, what about at the end of the term uh, in Let's stick with music if, mm -hmm. if we can. Well, I make one at the beginning of the term that they are to turn in towards the end of the term. Oh, I see. Okay. And that is... It's continuous. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, I do that because um, they are to apply their knowledge of the basic musical components within that assignment. Mm -hmm. And that is they must select a work by a Western art music composer and then one by a commercial recording artist more popular oh. and they are to compare how each of these would use the basic musical components how they hear them differently in each what would be an example of a of a comparison there well if you would choose uh, a symphony by Beethoven okay and then any rock musician mm -hmm. you know or it could be jazz a purely instrumental yeah. work or so. then if you choose a vocal western if you're going to choose an art song then you would choose a songster in the popular cultural realm. Do you see early drafts of this paper? Do they rewrite? They tell me who uh, it is. They tell me who it is. Mm -hmm. And um, they can let me see it if they are mm -hmm. uncertain of how they are doing it. You know, I'll yeah. take a look and say, okay, you're on the right track. Howard, what about uh, you? Occasionally, you'll find someone who's turning in a paper and they're referring to something as being great and wonderful because they think they have to be a mural and bounce back to you whatever image that you might have of this works. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is you don't have to like what an instructor or professor is liking. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and like a work, dislike a work, be indifferent about a work. The only provision that we ask of a student is that just tell us why. Back it up with something. Mm -hmm. It's an objective assessment. Right. And I, I stress that as well, mm -hmm. that you are not selecting something, you are not writing about something trying to please me. You know, because you don't know what I like, you know, but you are trying to develop your objective awareness and express an aesthetic awareness, you know. Bowden? I want to come again to something that Howard spoke of a moment ago, and that's the urgency of starting writing well in advance of the deadline mm -hmm. and criticizing and revising frequently. Mm -hmm. Recently, I heard a very well-known philosophical writer, Mortimer Adler, talk about how he got started in writing as a youth. It's a very interesting and illustrative story. Adler was junior high school age, had already had this aspiration to be a writer. His English teacher found out about it and called Adler in and said, um, I'll get you a start on writing. Go write me a description of a fire hydrant. So Adler went out, wrote a description of a fire hydrant in New York City, brought it back. The teacher wrote critical notes on it, gave it back, said rewrite it. Adler rewrote it. Teacher, he brought it back, teacher wrote critical notes on it, handed it back, said, rewrite it. If I recall correctly, Adler said it was a 28th draft. <laughs> the teacher read it, said it's perfect, handed it back to him, and said, don't change a thing. I guess a big question is, to, from a student standpoint, okay, I'm going to write uh, a reaction paper, I'm going to write a philosophical inquiry or I'm going to write an analysis or I'm, I'm going to learn special terms about art and philosophy. How's this going to help me in the real world? Well, we can say that it makes them a better person. And, but um, I think there's good for you, things. right? It's good <laughs> for you. But I think there are other reasons too. It, it, people expect pe other people to know certain things. And I call that Time Magazine, Newsweek type of knowledge. Y'all were talking about terms, and there's certain art terms that we all know, 
and we can wind up using them. We read them and they're not defined in Newsweek, but uh, they're there nonetheless. And there are other terms that only an artist would know, only a musician would know. So I would say that there's a certain body of, of uh, information that a successful person would wind up knowing. And here's an example. Early in my teaching, I asked the students to look up something in an encyclopedia, and one of them turned out to be about John Milton, and the student kept running across the library going, Mr. Denson, Mr. Denson, and waving a sheet of paper. And I thought something was, had gone wrong there, and he waved the sheet of paper with John Milton's name on it and said, that dude's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> a successful person who's going to make it in business or law, what have you, will know that John Milton is dead and won't be surprised about it. So if you're a judge, there is a body of knowledge that a potential judge, potential vice president of a firm has in sight. He or she may not even be aware of that, but the knowledge is there and it becomes part of us. And writing is thinking. Mm -hmm. of course. Exactly. Marion, how can the writing in your either humanities, general humanities course or or a music course help me uh, in the real world. I'm going to be a banker now. I'm going to study finance at the university level. Well, hopefully it would lead you to a deeper depth of, um, a deeper sense of, of who you are. And if you know who you are, then you're better able to relate to other human beings. And you will see yourself along the continuum of life you know, that we're a very important part of that continuum as it leads to the next generation. And I think practically just learning how to write uh, discourse, analyses, syntheses, explications is a nice practical uh, exercise. And if you can do that, chances are you can write good memos, good letters, and so forth. 